We are now talking to Sports Illustrated senior writer Greg Bishop. What's going on, Greg? Not too much, guys. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, Speedy, uh, when he posts up things, he he takes things to the next level. And when I checked out a little – I never read your book, so I definitely got to go check out your book, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, th- the person that you are and, and how, how you moved from one position to the other – it's a pretty sensational story, and now you're with, uh, you've been with Sports Illustrated for a little while, and uh, you're a senior writer over there. So what is that? How does that, and what does that feel like working for Sports Illustrated? Well, the mostly senior writer just mostly means I'm old, you know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I always age. wanted to write for the New York Times and for SI, and I was at the Times. My wife didn't love New York. I definitely did. I was there for seven years, and then I switched over so I could move back to Washington State. But, uh you know, we have maybe 25, 30 senior writers, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still one of my favorite things. I mean, you get to go cover whatever you want. Uh, stories are always interesting. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a dream job for sure. All right. So t- talking to goats, you never talk to me, and I am a goat by myself. I mean, Speedy, give me the goat sound that we were working on before the show. That's not a goat. It's bad. You know, <laughs> come on, use the right term over here. Anyways, um, tell us a little bit about your book and what made you decide to write a book like this? Yeah, you know, I've been trying to do different forms. You know, I do some TV writing for Showtime on the show All Access. I do a lot of documentary work in terms of scripts. And Jim Gray actually approached me with writing a book that was sort of about his life, but more about the people that were in it. You know, you're talking Pete Rose and that dust up. You're talking LeBron James and the decision. You're talking a lot of time with Tom Brady over the years, who I'm sure is your guys' favorite. Mm. You know, you're talking about living in John Madden's apartment in Dakota and Manhattan. Uh, and it, the idea was to explore his life through all the people that he's interacted with. And I remember going to the NBA Hall of Fame with him this past spring when he got inducted. And it was just wild to be like, I'm usually on the outside of the entourage, kind of looking in, you know, like hanging out and everyone wants to get rid of me. But, you know, Jim has the kind of life where, you know, Mike Tyson was there for him. Dr. J was there for him. I mean, the Mark Anastasio, the Brewers owner, was there for him. And the idea was to kind of explore what makes these people successful, you know, beyond a level that Jim or I have reached and really tell the book through their stories rather than his. So in terms of the focus of the of these different legends, because there's many of them in different uh, in different sports that I saw when I saw the cover of the book from individual sports like Michael Phelps and Mike Tyson to obviously team sports like Michael Jordan and Joe Montana and things like that. So how do you portray those kinds of things differently and how do you judge in terms of the philosophy of a legend, a goat? How would you describe that and in portray it in terms of comparing? Because a lot of people debate who is the goat in particular sports or positions. Right. And you kind of run into like the basic semantic problem, right? Like goat means one, you know, in in general. And we had to kind of define how we would do that. You know, to me, it was kind of like, has this person transcended sports in some way? And then the lens on how they're written about depends on Jim's interactions with them. So the the chapter of Mike Tyson is about all the crazy interviews they had. You know, you, you might remember the, you know, the one about eating children or, you know, the one after the ear biting, like Jim was like with him for all those. So it takes on sort of Tyson's personality, you know, the chapter of Muhammad Ali is a lot deeper and it's about, you know, this 30 year relationship they had when Jim's first interview was with Muhammad Ali when he was like 18 years old and then how that evolved over time all the way until Ali died. And then there's, you know, just a bunch of characters. John Madden plays a central role, you know, really interesting in light of everything that just happened. Uh, Bill Walton has a bunch of wild quotes in there. (laughs) Uh, we take you through the decision. We take you through everything that happened with Pete Rose. And, you know, the, the sort of just general baseline was like, is this someone we will talk about forever? You know, so that's Kobe Bryant. It's Michael Phelps. It's a level of sports personalities that I think most people don't get to know. As you guys know, we're talking to Sports Illustrated senior writer, Greg Bishop. We're talking about his book, Talking to Goats. Uh, obviously, if you don't know who Jim Gray is, well, then you're sleeping under a rock. I don't know what the heck you are. But uh, Jim Gray, I actually met Jim years and years ago. I've, I, I've been in the business for about 10 years. Uh, he's one of the bigger, more known American sportscasters. One of my favorites and one of my mentors, Ian Eagle, uh, is, it knows Jim pretty well. Tell us a little bit about like just following him around and, 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 and just talking to him or be, just 
being on the phone and having a conversation about all the different stories that Jim was telling you from one story to the other, a Tom Brady story to a Mike Tyson story to, uh, I don't know, uh, a Nick story with Patrick Ewing. What was it like just hanging out with Jim Gray and, and getting all the information and writing a book like this? Yeah, well, it was actually pretty interesting. You know, I deal with famous people a lot in my job, but it's just like kind of a different level, you know, we'll be riding in the car and he'll get like a FaceTime from Tyson, you know, or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And what really stood out to me are what you just said, the stories, you know, whether it's, you know, meeting Yoko Ono, you know, while living at John Madden's apartment or, you know, the way that Dr. J kind of adopted him as part of his family when he was starting his career in Philadelphia or how the decision came to be or all the time that he spent with Tom Brady over the years. I mean, there's just a level of depth, I think, to his relationships that stood out to me. Uh, most of them continue on to this day. And, you know, the, it was just story after story after story. In fact, I was uh, I had a long drive home today and I was actually talking to him and we were just telling Madden stories for like an hour, you know, and he was talking about this deli they used to go to in New York and how Madden would like look in the back. <laughs> and he'd say, Jim, what's the what's the difference between aged beef and old meat, you know, and you can just picture him with like a telestrator, like drawing it out, you know, and he's going to Madden's funeral next week. And it it just, uh, the amount of stories, I think that people that have been in the business that long, but also have reached that level of access and are able to tell, I mean, it's, it's just different than now, you know, I think they were a lot closer with people. And I think, you know, that really comes across in the stories that he tells for sure. So you actually texted me about an hour ago that you actually were with uh, Cooper Cup's parents today. Yeah. And it leads me to this question because, again, a lot of athletes all have their close people, whether it's whether it's family, whether it's close friends, whether it's a girlfriend or whatever. Is there a difference in terms of when you've had your experiences with them in comparison to maybe another athlete's pers- uh, impersonation of him, a Hall of Fame a voter, anything like that, or even it's just anyone in the industry like a broadcaster? Is there a different philosophy of the way they think of these guys that there is different? And if so, what are some of those experiences like? You mean in terms of like how I would look at that interview versus like the ones? Yeah, how they're portrayed. Like how, how do they how are they portrayed differently by those that are closer to them? Yeah, you know, I think guys a lot of times sort of um, go with what they're comfortable with. So you'll see a lot of athletes like Aaron Rodgers, for instance, right now does a lot of his interviews on the Pat McAfee show. You know, Jim's relationships were pretty long lasting. And then I think, you know, something like today, like I spent the day with the Cups in Yakima, Washington. You know, we went to like Cooper's favorite burger restaurant and, you know, kind of a hometown tour. Went by the high school, hearing old stories. Dad couldn't draft him on his fantasy team and he ended up losing (laughs) to the guy that did. And you're really just trying to get a sense, you know, of like what his life's really like. What are the dots that connect to like this crazy season that he's having? And I think, you know, it's it's kind of different with every guy. Some guys you go back to all the time. Some guys you're in regular contact with. You know, I still talk to some of the Jets from the time when I covered them back in 9 and 10 and 11. And, you know, to me, it's it's sort of individual basis. But one thing I've noticed about a lot of these guys is they're much more normal than you think, you know, uh, flawed. Mm-hmm. In some instances, funny in others. They're just not... They're not like as famous as they are famous, if that makes sense. They're regular people. Some of them are great. Other ones you'd rather not deal with again. But um, in general, interacting with them is more normal, I think, than people would expect. Well, speaking of an ex-Jet, uh, I did a show for uh, almost six months with Eric Coleman. Me and him were doing a show here on Long Island. Now he does a sports betting show on MSG. He's doing uh, – sincerely, he's doing very, very well, and I'm very happy for him. He's a friend. Uh, very happy, and we we did a show. We had a great show, very, very funny. I disagree with a lot of things he had to say when it comes to comparing and contrasting Allen Iverson to James Harden, which I think is ridiculous. But uh, (laughs) uh, that's a whole other story, and we're not going to get into that right now. Um, What are your thoughts to, you know, when you're around these athletes, and I've been around a lot of them, and I was an athlete myself, what is it like being around a superstar athlete that, you know, is considered a god in their sport, considered... Uh, a different personality to other people, but you as a writer uh, getting the information and, and, and putting on a piece of paper for them to, you know, for, for what they want you to know and for, for all the other people to know uh, about a story about themselves or even just about who they are, you know, behind the scenes. What is it like doing that? Yeah. You know, one thing I do now that I didn't do as much when I was younger is I really try to explain what I'm trying to get, you know, like this is kind of how I see the story. And like, this is what I think it looks like. Mm 
<laughs> but I want to really hear what they have to say because often I think these guys look at like people that do the job I do and they think that you come in with your story pre-written and you're sort of just trying to fill in the blanks and you know it's like a Mad Libs exercise you know so with Cooper for instance the you know the idea is like what went into this kind of season you know and I think there's maybe a sense from people that don't follow the NFL as closely that it just kind of came out of nowhere and so what I'm trying to do with the piece which will be out next week mm -hmm is really kind of connect those dots, you know, like how did it, how did this come to be? It's not as surprising as it may look. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of good fortune. It took a lot of, you know, growing up in Yakima and playing in Eastern Washington and all these things for him to then win the triple crown, which is pretty amazing. And I think it really helps to kind of bring it to a normal level. You know, I, I did our preview cover on Dak Prescott, for instance, and the idea was like, we sort of define him by these events that have happened to him. His brother died by suicide. He broke his ankle. His mom died from cancer when he was in college. And I just thought there was a lot more to it than that. And when I sat down with him at the cigar bar in Dallas, you know, this summer, the idea was like to explore how all these events brought him to the season and whether it sort of steeled him to do this thing that no Cowboys quarterback has done in a quarter century. And, you know, the, the idea is you, you talk through it with them. Like, it sounds like even though you and Eric disagree, you're able to sort of talk through how you see things where I think, a lot of times these guys are just expecting the same questions. I really like to ask weird stuff. I like to throw them off and talk about books and <laughs> podcasts and anything. Deck and I share podcasts and book recs to this day. And I think it's just to kind of bring it to a level of human to human rather than like famous person and totally not famous person, right. you know, and they tend to, I think, respond better to that. Or if they don't like it, they probably don't want the kind of story that I do. I want to know if there's anything in terms of your book or even the experiences you've had that addresses a lot of the controversial legends a lot of the time. We're seeing two of them now with the Baseball Hall of Fame with Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and also Kurt Schilling too, like a different, for a different reason. You saw Terrell Owens. It took three tries for him to get in the Hall of Fame. And they're kind of portrayed differently. And even some of the guys you mentioned, somebody like Mike Tyson and Muhammad Ali that were uh, like outspoken the way they were. So how do you how do you – how do you relate to those kinds of things and judge legend when it comes to those kinds of things? Are the scandals something that downgrades them or is it part of their story? Is it something good? Like you were talking about with Pete Rose. Yeah, I would say like uh, two parts to that. Like one is that I, I think that I, ju I would judge their like goatness for lack of a better term based mostly on what they did compared to their era. You know, so with the baseball guys, I sort of think, if they were all doing something that like, you know, maybe it's uh, odd to penalize, you know, a couple guys who were famous that got caught in terms of a story, like I'm attracted to the controversy. You know, I think that there's always something to do there. I think a lot of people cover sports leagues where they talk to owners and GMs and it's sort of a top down view. I like talking to guys about what their life is like, you know, and I I did a you mentioned Terrell Owens. I did a story on him for where they now a couple of years ago and I spent two days in L.A. with him. <laughs> And we're like driving around and he's like in a rental car with like, a you know, one of those spare tires on it and <laughs> talking about like all he ever really wanted to do was like go to a desert island and disappear because he understands how people think about him. Wow. And he realizes that he put himself in this situation and that mm -hmm. so much of the, the problem with him resulted from things that he himself did. Like that to me is really interesting material to like work with, mm -hmm. you know, it's like it's not to present him as like redeemed or like perfect or even better than his typical caricature would be. It's more to understand, like, how did he get there? What does he think about it? What does he think about being thought of this way? Like, you know, I, I pitched a story recently. They didn't respond yet, but like, I, I think Jake Cutler is really interesting, you know, and like now he's like, uh, so is his wife. <laughs> he's, like, he's like running a, a, for a school board seat in Illinois. And we got all this vaccine debate raging in schools. And I think that would be a really interesting piece. Like how does the most hated man in sports you know, ultimately, like, come to want to run for a school board seat because of how he feels about vaccines. And to me, like, rather than just sort of condemn him for it, I'm more interested in, like, why does he think that way? What does he think he can get out of it? And that kind of tension and, and you know, just character, like, I, I usually like writing about that more because I think it usually reads, you know, leads to more rich, interesting characters. I actually like Jay Cutler, by the way. I, I think he's a very funny guy. Uh, followed him from college football. I think he played for Vanderbilt. Yep. And then mm -hmm. uh, came to the NFL with the Broncos. He played very well for Brandon Marshall. 
Uh, that was an interesting connection. And then going, you know, going to Chicago. I and... still can't picture on a school board, though. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like Jay Cutler at I, all. <laughs> I will say this. Uh, Jay Cutler's show was pretty amusing, okay? Living on a farm and, and hanging out with his beautiful wife, who's like a, a clothing designer supermodel on a TV show from California. Interesting. 